Session three, in which I'm going to talk about how you can teach practical skills, even if you don't have access to a laboratory. Now, it might be because of current situations like the COVID-19 or more day-to-day -day factors like lab rotation, time, money and resources. But quite often you will find that you do not have the ability to teach a practical in a lab. Hopefully by the end of this session, you will see that actually that can be seen as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. The students having hands-on experience is invaluable and I would encourage you to get them to have as much hands-on experience doing practicals as possible. But don't see that as the only way you can teach them. And in fact, I would often give them lots of activities, practical skill-based activities, without the actual equipment anyway, even if I had access to a lab all of the time. And hopefully you'll see why over the course of this talk. Now, I'm going to cover three things. The first is how to approach teaching practical skills if you're not in a laboratory, before moving on to examples of practicals you can run at home, or more interesting, getting students to run at their homes. And finally, teaching practical skills without any practical element at all. So, how do you approach teaching practical skills if you're not in a laboratory? Now, the first thing here is don't try and replicate the lesson that you would do in the lab. You are not in the same situation. You are running a completely different lesson. And as such, your outcomes must be different. That can be seen as a massive advantage rather than a disadvantage, though. When we teach practicals in the laboratory, they are messy, they are busy, they are often limited in terms of time, and sometimes they don't work the way they should do. As far as teaching goes, it's really useful for, them to ex for the students to experience that, but it really limits your opportunity to teach specific skills, specific science, feedback opportunities are often limited. So by removing the actual practical element, it allows you to focus more on that teaching and feedback and exploring various things. And hopefully we'll see ways that you can do that. So the first way we're going to look at is how to replicate practicals at home. And ideally, this is not you videoing yourself doing it, although that is possible. It is getting the students to actually design and carry out the practicals themselves. Now, the best place to start here would be the course book and the teacher's guide, both of which have extensive notes on all of the practicals, both uh, required practicals and additional ones. And by exploring those notes, it will help you understand the practical and design a really good lesson outside of the laboratory. So let's look at an example. Now, the first one is probably the first practical that you would come to, which is from unit one, investigating the freezing temperature of water with different salinities. You've got to see the limitations as your route into this. You've got to see, get the students to explore how difficult this is going to be and use that as a, a teaching opportunity. So it's probably not unreasonable for the students to have a variety of equipment at home. So think they will have water, salt, a freezer, thermometer, possibly, but maybe not, certainly a stopwatch or a phone where they can time things, and hopefully some containers, ideally all the same size, but not necessarily so. So you can start to get them to think about the method they are going to use with that very limited equipment. So let's explore this. I think you can do it in two ways. You can explore it in a fairly simple way, or you can explore it in a really complicated way, and both have advantages. So some of the simpler things you might want to think about. The independent variable. Well, obviously different salt concentrations. In a laboratory, that would be fairly straightforward. But at home, that's really going to present real complications. How are they going to measure the volume of water? Perhaps they're going to use the mass of the water instead. You'd hope they'd have some kind of measuring cylinder or jug, but possibly not, or balances, scales to measure out the water. Same for the salt. How much salt do you know that you're putting in? And therefore, what concentration is the salt going to be? With limited equipment, that could be a real challenge. That gets you to explore what concentration values they're actually going to use. Remember, it's independent variables, so there should be at least five of them. And even the simple containers, are they all the same size? If they're not, then you're getting into control variables. So you can start to think about the Moving on, dependent variable. How are you actually going to measure the freezing point? 
If you've got a thermometer, that's probably fairly straightforward, but it's quite probable that your students do not have a thermometer at home they can use. Perhaps you could get them to think about putting all of the waters in the freezer at the same time and seeing which freezes the quickest. How are you actually going to know if it's frozen? What are you going to measure as a indicator of whether it's frozen or not? So again, explore this with your students. Get them to think about it and they will go into more detail than they would have done if they'd just done it in the laboratory. Control variables are again another opportunity. Where are you going to put the containers in the freezer? Is the freezer universal in terms of its temperature distribution? Starting temperature of the water, make sure they are all the same starting temperature. It sounds obvious, but if one's hotter than another, that's going to massively impact on your results. But I would say all of those are fairly straightforward ways to explore the practical, but you can definitely go into much more detail. In a laboratory, you would use distilled water. Now, it's highly unlikely your students have got a bottle of distilled water at home, but you can get them to think about why you use distilled water in the practical. In a lab, they just get a bottle and use it, but they perhaps don't think about why. You could get them to make their own version of distilled water, perhaps by boiling it and explore it, see what's possible with them. Likewise, the salt, they're not going to have marine salts, highly unlikely. They've probably got table salt, sodium chloride. That is not the same as the salt that's in seawater. Salt in seawater has many more things to it. And part of unit one is exploring the composition of seawater. So even just this difference between what you would have in a lab and what they've got at home is an opportunity to explore something. We then get on to the, the methodology, and you can talk about the accuracy. If they've got a measuring cylinder they, or a jug they use for cooking, well, how accurate is that going to be? How accurate are their scales? How are you going to do reliability? Do they have enough, enough containers to do three repeats of each concentration? Again, just explore this. Another practical you can do at home is pH indicators. Now, I'm not expecting your students to have pH probes or universal indicator paper, but you can actually make uh, pH indicators from things that can be bought in food stores. So for example, if you grind down red cabbages, blueberries, uh, beetroot, blackberries, all of these will change colour in different levels of acidity or alkali. You can always do some research online here to find out how these work. You then get into what acids could they use. So do they have access to lemon juice, vinegar for acids? Alkalis are a bit harder, soaps, soda water, but by exploring this, your students will appreciate the science a bit more. Obviously, they do need to know about pH probes, universal indicator paper, and litmus paper, which they're not going to have, but by doing the practical with fruits or, or beetroots, you can move into what they do actually need to do. Another one is biological drawings. This is ideal for doing at home. You can tell them to draw basically anything your imagination wants you to. Uh, half a fruit, a slice of banana, leaves, insects are very good. The course book actually has a drawing of a fish that you can get them to copy. Likewise, a search online for any image, they can, you can email them that image and they can do a drawing of it. Take a photo, email that photo, take a photo of their drawing, email it back to you and it's a really good opportunity to give feedback. So biological drawings, which are both in Unit 4 in AS and Unit 6 in A2, can definitely be done at home. But they are the most basic practicals, and they're probably pushing the limits of what you can do at home. The rest, you're going to have to abandon the practical element with, um, entirely and just focus on doing the skills without the hands-on experience. But this has many advantages. It's going to be faster, and it's definitely going to be cheaper if you don't have the equipment. Likewise, if you're removing the practical element, you know that it's going to work, whereas practicals in the lab often deliver results which perhaps don't do exactly what they should do. It allows you to focus on specific elements within the practical skills. If you actually do a practical, you kind of have to do the whole thing. You've got to do the results table, you've got to do the method, you've got to do the equipment. By not doing the practical, you can remove certain elements of this and make it much more focused on individual skills. This helps students develop a holistic view of practical skills. As covered in the last uh, session, many of the skills you want to teach them are 
holistic across the whole of the course, five independent variables, three repeats, safety using both the risk and the proportion. So by focusing in on these allows the students to see them in, in kind of more holistic pattern. And finally, the, the big advantage here is when your students come to be examined on this, they are not doing a practical. They are in a situation without the practical equipment. So it is getting them used to that environment. So it is a very good thing to do. Remember, you're not on your own here. There is lots of technology to help you. There are links in the teacher's resource to some YouTube videos or just search up yourself. There's lots of uh, teachers, particularly now with the COVID-19, lots of teachers going online and demonstrating practicals. There's also online games. A good example here is the rate of photosynthesis with light intensity. Again, a good search here. You will find interactive versions of that practical and you can get your students to run that and count the bubbles. And it's not perfect, but it's, it's an advantage. It's something they can do. And so it's nice. So don't think of this as you on your own. There are lots of people out on the internet who've done this and can so, two things you can do. You can run an entire practical or you can focus on individual skills. Now running an entire practical, or not doing the practical, but running through all of the skills is a big job that should definitely be done. Remember the scaffolding sheet from session two. You can have the same sheet here with certain things filled in for them so that they can run the entire practical as it were from home. The workbook actually has examples of how to plan practicals for students without doing the practical and I definitely recommend you have a look at that. They cover examples in both the required practicals and the additional practicals. That's teaching the whole practical and definitely a good thing to do but it might be that you want to focus on individual skills and I'm going to talk now about just a few teaching methods you can use to focus in on individual skills. So, writing a method. It could be that you give them an overview of a, the science, perhaps an overview of the hypothesis, perhaps give them the equipment list that's detailed in the course book and tell them to write a method. As I said before, usually when they start, they'll just write a paragraph, which maybe isn't much use. Get them to think about the bullet-pointed list. Again, the scaffolding sheet could be useful here. You could give them the method and ask them to analyse it. So look at limitations of the method, potential errors. Ask what control variables could be. Again, they're not going to do this, but just thinking about it is replicating the environment they'll be in the exam. So it really helps them in that situation. Results tables are very useful. You could give them a method and ask them to prepare an empty results table for you so you can see that they're laying out the results table in the correct way. Likewise, you could give them a list of results in a fairly terrible format and ask them to put it into a better format for you. Also, I find quite useful sometimes is to explore their understanding of the science is to give them an empty results table so you've set it up properly for them and again that's a good model of how to do that and ask them to make up their own results. Now only if they really understand the science will they be able to make up results that make sense and you're not going to be looking for specific numbers but you're going to be looking for overall trends and if they understand the science they should at least get the trend in the right direction. Graphs are a really important skill for the students. You can use the exemplar data that's found in the teacher's resource book here. Give them that data and ask them to prepare a graph for you. Again, as with the drawings, they can take a photo of that graph and send it to you or email it or do the graph online. I prefer the hands-on approach because that's what they're doing in the exam, but each situation is difficult. Now the graph skills themselves is listed as a math skill, but you will find help on that, or the students will find help on that in the practical skills chapter of the course book. You can give them the results tables, you can give them graphs and ask them to draw analysis and conclusions from that. The teacher's book again has exemplar graphs of the results, or it could be that you can make your own graph again, modeling what a good graph would look like and asking the students to see what the trends are and explain them and again apply the science here will allow you to examine their understanding of it and give that focused feedback. 
Everything I've talked about so far is trying to replicate a lab-based experiment. Now, in AS, you would be expected to do field work as well. But it's important to know that you can do this from home as well. You're not going to replicate the practical. But in the workbook, for example, there is a double page spread that shows a model shore with species distributed around it. And you could ask them to pretend to do quadrats or translates on that. So don't feel that you are limited to just the actual laboratory based work. You can also do all of these things for the field based work. So hopefully this is a way of showing you that being limited in your access to laboratory time and equipment isn't a major disadvantage. And in fact, doing these things out of a laboratory has many advantages. So to help you, think about the expectations and what you're going to get from the practical. Can you run the practical remotely? Can the students do it at home? And if they can't, can you focus on individual skills and really get into them in a way that perhaps doing a real practical would prevent you from spending that time on?